to start a new series and I'm going to mix it up and try and cover things that build some context about general aviation and, and aviation history in itself and also then get into some specific nerdy details along the way so that you know some of you who may know some of this will you know find some interesting things happening in the end we want to have you have a good context if you do want to become a pilot or you're interested in anything aviation or you just nerd out on planes um, there should be some meat in there in all of these for you that's me i nerd out on aircraft so so without any ado we'll get started with the first slide deck who was the first to fly first we have to define like flying right i mean if you jump off a cliff you're flying but you're not really in control and you don't go anywhere now I, people would argue that in these days because people have these squirrel suits right and they jump out and they've got about a one-to-one -one glide ratio so they can really cover a lot of ground you know if you jump at fifteen thousand feet that means you can cover three miles over ground in your squirrel suit right so that maybe would definitely be considered flying, but potentially non-mythologically, the first kind of recognized pilot was this poor prince, Huan Yang Tao, who is imprisoned by a rather ruthless emperor, Gao Yang, who forced his prisoners to jump off of a 33 meter tower with basically a bamboo mat and see if they can fly. So um, he did this to many, many, many prisoners and none of them survived until our poor Prince Juan came along and actually was able to control the bamboo mat. And I don't even know what this thing's gonna look like because there's no real pictures of it. This is the uh, ruthless emperor giving his edict. Uh, but apparently he flew about two kilometers and survived. So this potentially is the first pilot. And this is back in the 600s, right? So this is like way, way, way long, long, long ago before they even had like manned kite flights and stuff like that or balloons, hot air balloons, anything like that. Um, unfortunately, he didn't get to go free the uh gao yang was nowhere near nice enough to say actually if you survive your flight you can uh, be a free man he threw him back in prison and he died of starvation okay so keep that as a as a motto as we go along early pilots they all die <laughs> so we're gonna not deal with balloons or kites or tethered things. So we're going to talk about free machines. So when we're dealing with aircraft or aviation, usually we're, we're interested in dealing with machines that are uh, free of the ground. So, and the first machines that were free of the ground that were able to fly are gliders. So that means untethered, but we didn't have engines yet. Um, so these are a couple that are famous. This is Otto Lilienthal with one of his gliders, and this is one of the Wright brothers' original gliders. So for our intents and purposes, we're talking about real aircraft, which means untethered, guided by pilots. Now, uh, an oft overlooked figure in aviation is this guy, Sir George Cayley. In fact, he's basically considered the father of aviation, and he was alive in the early 1800s and identified by building models. He actually built a model of the glider that he then built, you know, many years later in like, I think 1810. He identified the forces that we all know, but were here to then un documented in specificity as drag, lift, weight, and thrust. So in order for aircraft to work correctly, we need to know the forces on it, the physics of the actual object. And he was able to identify these four main components that you need to deal with in terms of being able to have flight. He also proposed fixed wing machines instead of flapping machines. Many of you have seen like Leonardo da Vinci's drawings where he's got 
a helicopter and it's rotating or he's got wings that flap and stuff because all these guys were inspired by birds and how birds fly and they power themselves by flapping their wings. Um, but he figured more in terms of the aerodynamics and then how a fixed wing machine would be a lot lighter and uncomplicated. And he introduced the camber into the wings for stability and also really foresaw the need for lightweight propulsion. So in essence, this guy who really didn't fly much himself, but was very, very inspired by um, birds and physics to try and create aircraft that men could fly was considered the father of aviation. So both Otto Lilenthal, the Wright brothers, everybody that came in the next generation of, of aeronautical pre-engineers or whatever you want to classify them, they were all basically um, given much inspiration by this guy's writings. He published a bunch of kind of technical work. And, uh, so with that, we're going to switch to a quick mini physics lesson because we just talked about some physics. There's three main uh, classifications of observations. When we do science or we do even engineering, we're mostly concerned with observing things, measuring, classifying, quantifying, qualifying, and then uh, testing, right? And then observing again or build a new device or, you know, try it again or observe a new phenomena. So in the context of physics, there's three main uh, paradigms, three main kinds of uh, quantities that we look at. And the three are put up here, obviously. We have statics, which is observe quantities that don't really change with time. So that's stuff like, um, you know, over a course of an hour, if you went outside and measured the irradiance of the sun, so it's how much radiation is landing on your skin, that could be a static property. It's like the UV index. It's a static property for that hour. If we consider it over the course of 24 hours, it's not static because the sun comes up and the sun goes down, so it's changing over time. But if you go and weigh yourself right now, that's called a static measurement because while you're measuring yourself, while you're measuring your COVID gut, uh, the mass doesn't change unless you're eating a, <laughs> unless you're eating a cream puff at the same time, right? <laughs> then the mass is changing. So statics is the uh, realm in physics where we talk about things like mass, temperature, composition, chemical composition, things like that. That all falls under static. Kinematics is the measure of things that are basically in motion. So when something's in motion, it stays in motion, like Newton's laws. Um, and we can measure its properties. And that means that basically we're talking about velocities, the position of something as it changes in time. So that's kinematics. And we can have then things that um, we measure in kinematics and we estimate energy exchanging properties, but we're still doing kinematics to measure it. So that's the realm of kinematics. So when you're driving down the road, and you're just going along and at 60 miles an hour, that's a kinematic measurement. And then we have the most fun stuff, which is dynamics. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but I am a geophysical fluid dynamicist. That's the realm in physics that I work in. It's fluids of the earth and how they exchange energy. So geophysical fluid dynamics is that realm, which means we're gonna be measuring changes in energy. And what we mean by that is it can be um, potential energy, like something is in a potential source and then it changes to kinetic energy. So it begins to move or we could have chemical to kinetic energy. So this would be when we have a chemical change in composition, it produces motion. Like when we go out and fire our rockets, that's a chemical to kinetic dynamic energy exchange. So we're burning a solid propellant and it becomes thrust and our rockets go up into the air. It can be potential energy to internal energy. So if I've got two surfaces sliding together at the same kinematic rate, but we all know that if you rub things together, what do we produce? We produce friction, right? So the friction turns into internal heat. So that's a dynamic change. Friction is a dynamics. 
So hopefully our little mini physics lesson uh, comes into play. If I'm just flying along with my plane and I've got my six pack, I'm looking at a lot of kinetic qualities. I've got my altitude, I've got my, I've got my attitude, I've got my speed, I've got all these things in the aircraft. But then as soon as I pull on the yoke or I push in the throttle, I'm making a dynamic change. I'm changing, I'm changing what's happening. And so those, those forces come into play. Anyhow, back to Serge George Kelly. Uh, this, this is a replica of his glider. Um, it looks like it's steered with a tiller that goes to that empennage, the second empennage. So you see the there's like a there's like a little elevator and a rudder all in one on one stick and you steer it with that stick and he's got basically almost just a kite like structure with an empennage and then I say this is just a boat with wheels but anyhow so this is one of the first objects to actually fly with a pilot um, and this was flown in 1853 and unfortunately it was not recorded who exactly was the pilot it's estimated to be either Kaylee's uh, assistant or there was a young kid who was often around him who was lightweight maybe that flew some of his stuff but they don't really know who the first pilot was but this was the first basically modern aircraft. Would you guys fly this thing? It doesn't look so safe to me, but anyhow. <laughs> Kaylee inspired a whole uh, generation in the Victorian era. So Victorian era is the late 1800s. So remember, we were having a civil war during this time and all sorts of things are happening around the globe. So that's that period of time in the late Victorian era. Um, they, uh, Kaylee inspired many, many others to go out and really start testing these things and start to um, apply his ideas and reinforce them. In fact, let me go back and just show you one thing. So everybody says Otto Lilienthal was amazing. Well, he was amazing, but um, look at the shape of Kaylee's glider. Notice how it's got like, uh, like different areas where it's more like a kite, right? Like it's more taking air and just redirecting it backwards. And he did have camber to this. So those were his ideas that brought into play, but we've got like double bottom surfaces here. And this is not particularly aerodynamically efficient. It's aerodynamically efficient just in the where the force is applied. There's a longer wingspan here. So you get a little more force in the front less wingspan here, so you get a little less force in the back. That leads for a little bit of a lift direction, forward center of gravity, allowing it to kind of have a stability factor. But basically, this is a kite, right? And then if you notice, Otto actually realized, wait a second, we have, we have a camber to his wings, but he's like, wait, I want to, uh, birds fly, and they have a very distinct surface to their wings. And there's a curve to it. So he put the curve in there and made that a big part of his glider. So now the air is being redirected in a way that's starting to become more aerodynamic. Yeah? Airflow flowing over the top surface has a little bit different path than airflow flowing over the bottom surface. Um, you'll notice something distinct about his glider too, which I didn't realize until I actually put this presentation together because I, I we'll, we'll watch a video of guys who rebuilt one of these. Um, his arms are like fixed in place. He's holding onto a bar and, and the, his arms are fixed in place. The rest of his body moves off of the, kind of off of his shoulders as the pivot point. So he's controlling this glider completely by a very flimsy tail surfaces that, you know, redirect and stabilize it. And then just literally moving the mass from side to side, just like a hang glider. So. I found a pretty cool video we can check. Okay, so this is a couple minute video, which is really pretty cool. These guys were, these guys were crazy.
So how cool is that? That they went back and rebuilt Otto's glider and actually got it to fly. But that thing looks pretty sketchy to me. Pretty sketchy. So I will say that Otto, um, you know, refined that design. He did a lot of work. He made over 2,000 flights in that glider. So even though it looks really sketchy, clearly, you know, it had a lot of, a lot of good properties that came into play. Um, unfortunately, Otto is one of those that we can list as deceased by aviation accident. So we get on to the first actual airplane, the first airplane. So the first powered flight was made by Orville Wright on December 7, 1903. So the Wright brothers, they took even Otto's designs and things and came up with a lot of different innovations. One of them, they realized drag was a big component in the type of wing design that Otto had. So they covered the bottom surface of their wings to prevent that air from slowing down due to the sticks and the string. So they realized that there was a drag component and that actually benefited them in terms of airfoil design. So they started to play with more of a, you know, more of a two-dimensional cross-sectional airflow, airfoil, you know, and they started to think of things in different ways. They innovated many different control ideas. So they're using forward canard control instead of trailing elevators for some of these designs. Um, the flyer, the first one to actually fly, weighed 700 pounds. So that's a pretty, pretty robust big machine, pretty heavy. And uh, it looked like this. Here's the plans. There's a lot of wires, a lot of sticks and strings. They realized they needed enough lift, so they made it into a biplane. That also helped stabilize the structure because you've got, if you have one flimsy wing, you need to have a bunch of support struts. So they figured if they just make another wing, you can have more lift and not have all these struts sticking up everywhere. So this was the flyer. Um, there's a huge controversy, only really it's only Brazilians who are worried about this controversy. But to this day, if you run into a Brazilian friend or so, they'll literally tell you, no, no, Santos Dumont was the first to fly. And it's a ridiculous argument. Uh, he flew his machine in 1906 and it looked like this. It wasn't even as sophisticated as the Wright Flyer, basically. And that was actually literally three years later. One of the things that made this a uh, little bit of a controversy is the Wright brothers really didn't publicize their flight until 1905. Like, people knew they flew, but they didn't go around trying to generate publicity or anything. They're bent on building a better machine, so they didn't go around, um, you know, publicizing it until they had it down. But even 1905, when they did publish, they, it's two years later. It's just ridiculous that anyone would believe this. But that's what you have. Well, what if you go to Brazil, you'll find those people. Okay, this was pretty cool. Uh, this isn't actually the 1903 flight, but it's a really, really good discussion. Wright brothers combined all of the latest technology during their time and developed technology of their own to bring the world the first controlled, powered, and sustained, heavier-than-air human flight. Much like Leonardo da Vinci, the Wright brothers spent a great deal of time observing birds in flight. They read about the works of George Cayley and the hang-gliding flights of Otto Lilienthal to learn more about aerodynamics. Following a successful glider test, the Wrights built and tested a full-size glider at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They chose Kitty Hawk as their test site because of its wind, sand, hilly terrain, and remote location. In 1901, at Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, 
the Wright brothers flew the largest glider ever flown with a 22-foot wingspan, a weight of nearly 100 pounds, and skids for landing. However, many problems occurred. They decided to build a wind tunnel based on Francis Wenham's research to test a variety of wing shapes and their effect on lift. During 1902, the brothers flew numerous test glides using their new glider. Their studies showed that a movable tail would help balance the craft based on the center of gravity, and the Wright brothers connected a movable tail to the wing warping wires to coordinate turns. After months of studying how propellers work, the Wright brothers designed a motor. This was attached to a new aircraft sturdy enough to accommodate the motor's weight and vibrations. The craft weighed 700 pounds and came to be known as the Flyer. The Wrights further redefined the wings by covering the bottom surfaces with fabric. This resulted in a smoother overall wing surface, which enhanced its aerodynamic efficiency. The brothers continued to apply the fabric in the direction of the weave at a 45 degree angle to increase the stiffness of the wings. One of the most innovative aspects of the 1903 Flyer was its propeller. The Wrights decided to treat the propeller as if it were a rotating wing. They reasoned that the same physics that generated an upward force or lift on a curved surface in a flow of air would also produce a horizontal force or thrust when such a surface was positioned vertically and rotated to create the airflow. The brothers built a movable track to help launch the flyer. This downhill track would help the aircraft gain enough airspeed to fly. After two attempts to fly this machine, one of which resulted in a minor crash, Orville Wright took the flyer for a 12-second sustained flight on December 17, 1903. This was the first successful, controlled, powered and sustained heavier-than-air human flight in history. In 1904, the first flight lasting more than five minutes took place on November 9th. The Flyer II was flown by Wilbur Wright. How cool is that, right? There's some famous footage that people claim they have of the first flight, but it's actually from uh, reproduction like many years later. So just before the war, we're gonna talk about the last little bit. I'm gonna end this series at just before World War I because that's when a huge transition happens in aviation and we'll get to, we'll get to that uh, in, a, in a separate, probably in, the ne in a month in the next one. But what a lot of people don't realize, so they flew in 1903, they built the Wright Flyer II in 1904 that flew for five minutes, right? And by 1905, they had constructed quite a number of machines, I mean, a much better machine that was flying around quite well. And the Wrights kept building better and better machines. At this point, by 1905, a lot of people started building better and better machines and were inspired to fly you know, their own kind of test aircraft based on different designs. So if you go from 1903 to 1909, that's like six years, right? Within just six years, you have a technology that's at its infancy to an actual explosion of people trying to build airplanes. And I'm going to demonstrate that by showing you a list of all aircraft types, right? And we're at 1903. So most of these machines here are either gliders or attempted motor gliders or concept planes. We know that 1903, the first actual powered aircraft, December 17th, the Wright Flyer flew. So 1903, we could just call this literally one successful actual aircraft. And then most people, you know, still weren't focused on aircraft, but it even goes down to less attempts. The Wright Flyer II comes out in 1904. 1905, we've got the Wright III, we've got airships, we've got a lot more gliders, a lot of tempt float plane gliders, a lot of different types of planes people are 
the uh, Santos Dumont helicopter, the Santos Dumont airship, the Santos Dumont. I mean, this guy was trying to go for it too. 1906. So this is when now the Wright Flyer 3, they did, the Wrights flew around and it was well documented in, in uh, newspapers and news articles and people knew about this. So the Wright Flyer 3 was a flying machine that could stay in the air and that amazed people wherever it went. So now look at 1906. You've got biplanes, you've got all different companies jumping into this thing and we've got what maybe 15 or so attempts look at 1907 now you've got two columns maybe there's 30 attempts now 1908 1908 we've got I mean what if we ex estimate this is about 30 30 to, there's probably 90 different types here the now you've got companies that are putting out different types they've got biplanes monoplanes the Blero company right and you've got other companies putting out versions they've got different countries having different levels of airships and airplanes right now 1909 i want you to see this so I'm not even going to try and estimate how many <laughs> there are right there, right? I mean, can you guys believe that? Like, think about right now. There's only a few major aircraft manufacturers, and there's a few kit-built aircraft manufacturers, and then there's people around, you know, Experimental Aircraft Association. Nowhere near this many types of aircraft are probably even, you know, considered right now, like, as major attempts, you know. And then you get to 1910 and it just stays the same. Massive, 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 massive list of, of aircraft. So in 1909 is when we really have the explosion of the technology. So the technology makes a huge change in this year, 1909. We can go back and kind of take a look. So remember 1908, we're we estimated what like there's about 90 different things 1907 hardly any so literally you go from 1903 the first flight kind of skip a year 1905 is when the first things get publicized so i'd say 1905 is the start of the spread in the western world of aviation 1906 people are getting used to actually seeing some things fly and they're starting to do their own thing 1907 a little bit more so we're talking about from five four years for four years from 1905 to 1909 and now you've got just hundreds hundreds and hundreds and hundreds so hope you that get hopefully that gets you some perspective of what happened at that time period and it's the same thing like having a cell phone you know no one had cell phones and then four or five years later everyone has a cell phone so in the kind of elite world of tinkerers and um people producing a new technology. No one had airplanes. And then within five years, everybody and their brother wanted to build an airplane. Uh, and there's a little problem with that. Um, so remember 1905, there weren't that many pilots. 1906, still not that many pilots. By 1907, there's enough pilots. 1908, right before the explosion, I found the statistics. So one in five pilots, 1908, one in five pilots died. So for every thousand miles flown in an aircraft, someone bit the big one. So this wasn't a profession you wanted to be in at the start of aviation. This was, this was definitely high risk activity. In fact, this is like the same level of craziness as like the daredevil wingsuit guys who fly through canyons, you know, those guys drop like flies. So, it's the same thing. These people built airplanes, had a blast, and then crashed. Four years later, right before the war, just remember this is, I'm ending the series as just before the war, the first one, the first big misunderstanding, by the way. Uh, 1912, I didn't find the rate for 13, but 1912, the death rate had fallen to one in every 51 pilots. So one death for every 100 thousand miles flown still 
like if you went to get a job and you're like okay i want to be a checker at safeway and they said oh yeah about one in 50 of you's you know choke on a bag and die right or something because <laughs> you're or you, you trip in the parking lot and get run over by by a grandma um you would never take that job <laughs> right that is an unacceptable high loss of life for any kind of profession this is really high but it's 10 times lower than what was four years before so uh it's it's aviation have its had its issues in its infancy and you can imagine why these things had no safety gear no safety protection there's nothing you know maybe some of them put a seat belt on but what's that going to do just keeps you strapped to your little leather seat while you plow in with hot gasoline and and sticks around you so um and then we'll end with uh a a, a type that's right before the war. Uh, this is the Blackburn Type D. I like this aircraft, it's pretty cool. And this is an actual flying example in a museum in England. Uh, so it's some of these old, old uh, machines. One, it's hard to get, it's hard to get them to stay preserved because they're not particularly made to last. And two, it's hard to keep them maintained because there's a lot of specific parts. And these old engines are completely different to anything that we have in this day and age. But anyhow, this machine, look at this, this is so cool because, so nine years before the Wright Flyer, the Flyer, um, 1903, the Flyer weighed over 700 pounds. And in nine years, we've got a machine that's capable of sustained flight flying around at 60 miles an hour. 32 foot wingspan with a 50 horsepower motor and it only weighs 550 pounds. So they had much more capability and much lighter weight. So you can see the technology was just uh, exploding and moving forward and, and actually this thing's really cool. And in 1949, we'll pull back into the sky. The red, it's the magic you see before you. No. I personally like these types of video better because I want to hear the real sound. I don't care about music in the background or something. But imagine being back in that time and you know, seeing this type of aircraft fly by. It's crazy. I'm bringing to an end of perfect. Thank you.
Yeah, can you imagine tooling around the air in just a bunch of twigs and and fabric, and a little bit of metal right in front of you, and that's about it. 550 pounds of, of sticks and and fabric. That's pretty fun, 60 miles an hour. Joker coming in again, hot. Yeah, Joker did it again. I'm not sure. We gotta, we, I think he's a ringer. We have to exclude him from the competition. He's too good. Okay, I have another presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about pilot safety. In the beginning, it wasn't good. And now we're actually moving on. So I'm going to talk about pilot safety from that 1913 Point forward. So at that point, at the beginning of the war, the pilots were considered not as valuable as the machine itself. Uh, aircraft were rare. Pilots, there's tons of them. Um, there's a perspective about it. So, and there wasn't, obviously, there wasn't a lot of flight training. People weren't uh, have high air time, you know, you don't have like the 2000 air, air hours as a commercial pilot or anything. So we're talking about an era when we're still in the infancy of aviation. So safety wasn't really a factor yet, but it soon became a huge factor. So in the course of the first big misunderstanding, one in five British pilots perished. That's a lot, 4,000 pilots. Well, the first to think about this kind of stuff, uh, you know, people strap themselves in, harnesses, obviously fire suits or, or things that protected them from the elements or protect themselves from a crash. Well, what if you can have to just plain bail out? Uh, this isn't the first parachute, but this is the first kind of man portable parachute and it's attributed to Gleb Kotelnikov. This is a great big canister thing. Uh, to me, that doesn't look very safe, but it is in fact a parachute. And it's not until the actual end, near the end of the war in 1918, when we get reports of the first uh, people that were bailing out of a stricken aircraft. So we went through the whole World War I and the safety margins didn't really increase much. The aircraft became phenomenally better than just six years before. Remember the video we just watched of the uh, uh, of the aircraft from 1912 putzing around at 60 miles an hour, kind of, you know, open cockpit, string and sticks. Well, now you've got doped, sleek fuselages, very much more aerodynamic, um, much larger engines, much higher power, and much higher speeds and machine guns and speed and maneuverability were the name of the day by the end of the war. So 19 air, 1918, we get to one of my favorite aircraft from that particular misunderstanding, and that's the Albatross, which is, just looks cool. Uh, so we get to the point, oh, this one's gone, huh? This was a path video of one of the first air, one of the first uh, parachute jumps. The guy literally walks out the wing, attaches the parachute, which is already at the wing, and then jumps, it's crazy. We get to World War II, the second big misunderstanding, and we have now no sticks, no dope surfaces. Sometimes the tails were still a uh, dope surface. Uh, these are all aluminum. Uh, Fuselages are much larger, massive radial engines, and they're flying around at, you know, 200, 300 knots. So 
the planes got faster, you can't just easily walk out. Um, they were they were definitely needing some safety issues. And so you still had a parachute at this point, but bailing out became an issue as well, just because falling out of this thing, you're likely to get hit by the elevator or rudder, which is what happened to uh, the first Bush, who was an aviator during the war, and he bailed from his Avenger. All the rest of his crew had already died, and uh, he survived to go on to be the head of the CIA. <laughs> oh yeah, and president too. Ah, this one's here. This is good. Shortly before the big attack, the United States aircraft were busy shooting up enemy fighters in the normal run of duty. These combat shots give some idea how American pilots helped to clip the German raiders in the New Year's Day attack. One Nazi pilot very soon had enough. He jumped for it. That's some great stuff, but. I put that in there, but did you see how, like, wow, you had to roll out of the cockpit of the airplane while being shot at and deploy your parachute and then sink down into the forest. Whoo, that's just crazy. And that's the level of, of uh, safety that you had during World War II. There was, you know, your expectation of surviving is not particularly good, but the parachute did offer you a chance. Um, by the time we get to the Korean conflict, we're starting to see methods of egress. So egress means you leave the vehicle, and uh, that definitely means ejection seats. So ejection seats were beginning to be tested. It offered the pilot a safe way to egress the vehicle and the ability to withstand the forces of the air around you, you know, when you're traveling at four or 500 miles an hour. So this is a, a series of photos, gun camera images during the Korean conflict of a pilot ejecting from a MiG-15. I thought it was fantastically interesting. So the Russians were copying the ejection seat idea as well. Oh yeah. If you want a happy afternoon when you're super bored, go look up on YouTube ejector seat testing. At Edwards Air Force Base, tests continue on new model ejection seats, never ceasing research to increase the narrow margin of safety afforded America's jet airmen, keeping pace with the greater speeds and greater hazards of tomorrow's combat planes. Dummies ride the seats, shot aloft from the hurtling rocket sled. Here, a multiple ejection from a simulated stratojet cabin. An unusual scene from the Defense Department camera shows the force with which the seat is ejected, necessary in flight to get clear of the plane. Here on the ground, the dummy shoots aloft high enough for the chute to open. A rough landing in store for the dummy, but for some future jet pilot in trouble, the results of this test may mean a life saved. That doesn't look like fun, right? But, I mean, you're alive, but wow, did you see how how strong that dummy was yanked around when the parachute first opened. Woo, that is crazy. So we get to the modern ejector seat, which is uh, really a thing of marvel. The biggest problem with these is that you gotta get out of the aircraft so fast, especially for the supersonic fighters, that oftentimes, you know, someone who survives one or two of these ejects, they've actually got some vertebrae damage um, in your back. So you just, the forces, of the rocket motor going, you know, it's gonna save you, but it, it's gonna, apparently a couple guys claim that they're like half an inch shorter after one eject. 
Um, you can see it's quite a fantastic device. At the top over here, we've got an extractor chute. You've got these gas bottles that contain oxygen so that when you eject at high altitude, your mask is still functioning and you don't black out. You've got uh, the drogue chute that comes out afterwards. It's got a radio beacon. You've got, uh, you've got, where's the rockets? It's in there somewhere. It even has a flight data recorder for the seat itself, which is just amazing. So these are really good complicated devices that are built for our airmen to ensure that the last possible chance, and these are called zero, zero seats too, which means that you can pull the eject if you're even down on the deck. So, and what happens is when he pulls it, either the canopy is blown off or the canopy itself explodes and often has to pull a screen down over the front of his head in case of an exploding canopy so that pieces don't come in and, and uh, impact the, his helmet and mask. Then you get a rocket ignition that lights up in the back and drives you clear of the aircraft. And then you clear the seat and your chute, your personal chute opens up. Pretty interesting, good stuff. Just so you can get an idea of what it would feel like if you were in one of these cockpits. Um, there's a nice little video here. Let me think, see if I remember exactly which one this is. I can hear close right stop. This is a Canadian T6 NL. T6 NL. Okay. okay. Around the we'll horn. Go back to that. Okay, we can start over. So watch on this part of your screen right here. You'll see what happens. They're flying along. I can hear close right stop. Right. Talon's a twin trainer. That, see that? Oh. That was a bird. So. T6 NL. T6 NL. There's no okay. light from the engine. Okay. Around the horn, restart. T6 means this temperature. It's a warning. Prepare to abandon aircraft Gear not buddy. done. Prepare. Gear not done. Just going to try to get a relay going. Okay. Just get her from the front. All right, going to fly the plane. Okay. Okay, engine is up. Stop. Okay, perfect. Okay, you cool? Engine. T6 okay, ready to go. I'm ready. Okay. And Mike and two were ejected to the north. We have an engine failure. Okay, prepared about an aircraft. Ejected, eject, eject. Mike and two, copy your break out to the north. Yeah, so you'll notice in that, so that's an instructor with a training pilot. The instructor's in the back. Clearly, he takes over the aircraft, gets as much altitude as possible when the no lights, I mean, when the engine goes out. And you can tell he's sitting there calm, gets as much altitude as he can, does the death turn. There's a no light. They can't make it back to the field. So they eject. That's pretty crazy, right? It can't be fun to be in that situation. But if you stay calm and you know what your safety systems are, um, you know, it's, it's not like you're not going to survive. This one was a hard landing in a Corsair. And during the hard landing, punctured something. So watch, canopy goes out, radio man goes out. Or no, that was just the pilot, I think. Yep. That has got to be harrowing as well, right? <laughs> oh, wow. You have like one second to really decide what to do. And then that's why the landing deck on an aircraft carrier is angled. See how close that pilot landed in the water? Well, if you landed straight on, what would happen to you? Yeah, the ship would run you over, so.
We have an angled deck for that exact one. And here's the last one. This one's really quite good, too. When Canadian Forces Captain Brian Buse took to the skies late last month in a CF-18 fighter to practice for an upcoming air show, the BG Disco Classic Staying Alive was playing over the sound system for spectators on the grounds. No one could have guessed that song would foreshadow what was about to happen. Buse was rehearsing an alpha pass when something went terribly wrong. His plane hit turbulence and began to plummet. With only moments to spare, Buse hit the eject button and was thrown from the jet as it crashed to the ground and burst into flames. Just four seconds passed between the time Buse ejected from the cockpit and the time he hit the ground. Luckily, the wind carried him away from the wreckage of his jet. The veteran pilot said his training and instincts saved his life. I knew where the jet was going, and I didn't want to be there with it, so I knew my only chance of survival was to, to pull the ejection handle. Despite the horrific crash, Buse only suffered compression fractures to his spine. Doctors say he should make a full recovery, but as the Bee Gees say, Buse really is lucky to be staying alive. I like how... He just suffered some compression fractures to his spine. No big deal, you know. Uh, and here's another famous one. Everyone should know about this. This is the famous F-16 ejection lightning reflexes. But unfortunately, uh, his ground team had set the pro improper altitude for this field. And he didn't double check it. Went up to do a full roll and had less, a thousand feet less altitude than he needed. This was. Knock it off. Thunderbirds, knock it off. Go, Rick. Thunderbirds, knock it off. Go, Rick. Go, Rick. One, knock it off. Two, knock it off. Two, knock it off. Knock it off. So I like that one because it actually leaves the comms in. I mean, these guys are so professional that immediately, you know, they're in the middle of doing the maneuvers in the show. And the knockoff is the call for uh, exiting the performance space and going back to actually just flying an aircraft so then you're going to be under controller control and you're outside of the um, performance so that's pretty cool it's unfortunate that that accident happened that was career ending but that's all right okay this is the end of our first section i hope everyone enjoyed that if you got any questions please bring them up that's one of my favorites just because we get to watch all sorts of cool dynamic action and uh and it also demonstrates how safe our modern uh, military aircraft are they they've really concentrated on safety systems and our pilots we have a very low death rate um, we do a lot of activities in the in in the full across the, mer the the military space in terms of aviation and the safety record is really a thousand times better than 1912